Hello, so the boy at the back of the class, so we're now on chapter 10. Chapter 10, War and Missing Pieces. On the day after the big fight, just as Tom had guessed, Armit became famous. In the playground, wherever he went, people pointed and gasped and called him the boy who beat Brendan the bully. And they asked him lots of questions like, is it true you can do a hundred punches in under a minute? And what were you really fighting over? Was it your parents' ransom money? And when are you going to fight again? Can we come and watch? After a while, Mrs Hemsey began to tell everyone to leave Armit alone. So everyone started asking Michael and Josie and Tom and me their questions instead. I didn't say much and neither did Michael, but Josie and Tom got so excited that they started to add new bits to the story. So by the end of the week, most of the school believed that Armit hadn't just beaten up Brendan the bully, but he had fought Chris and Liam too, over a suitcase full of red diamonds and a pink basketball. All of this made Brendan the bully scowl more than ever. But even though he stared at us all the time and Chris and Liam showed us their fists whenever they saw us, they didn't chase us around the playground or steal Josie's football or smash into us when we were carrying our lunch trays, like they would used to. I bet he's scared of us now that we've got our mitt, grinned Tom. Yeah, said Josie. He's a proper scaredy cat now. But Michael said he didn't like it one bit and that he bet Brendan the bully was up to something. At first, I didn't believe him, but then lots of strange things began to happen to Armit. The first thing happened just two days after the big fight. We had all been decorating a new pot for our photosynthesis plants, and Mrs Khan had given Armit a golden star because his plant had grown faster than anyone else's. I think that was because every morning, before Mrs Khan called the register, he would water it and talk to it for one whole minute. I didn't know that plants could speak different languages, but when I asked Mrs Khan about it, she said plants could speak every language under the sun and that the more languages they heard, the faster they grew. Armit was really proud of his golden star and he got a silver one too for decorating his pot with pictures of seashells and whales and fish. But when we got back from last break that afternoon, his pot was lying broken on the floor and his plant had been stamped on. Someone must have smashed it on purpose because nobody else's plant pots were hurt at all. Mrs Khan said that if the person who did it didn't put their hand up right away, they would be in big trouble. But nobody did put their hand up, so the mystery of the murdered plant pot stayed a mystery. Then, almost exactly a week after the, after the mystery of the murdered plant pot, came the day of the deathly worm tray. After assembly, one morning, Mrs Khan told us all to get our workbooks from our class trays. But when Armand pulled his open, he found it bursting with a whole pile of large, fat, wriggling worms. He cried out and dropped the tray on the floor so that all the worms went flying across the classroom. That made Dean, who sits on the table behind me, be sick all over his table. Dean is scared of anything that doesn't have any legs on it, even snails, but he hates worms the most. Mr Whitaker, the school cleaner, had, come and cleaned, had to come and clean it all up and Mrs Khan and Mrs Hemsey were very angry and checked all our trays. But no one else had a single worm in their tray, not even Tony the nose picker, who likes to collect all kinds of strange things in his tray. Mrs Khan told the person who had done it to put their hand up again, and this time she looked at Brendan the bully, as if she wasn't really speaking to any of us and only to him. But again, nobody put their hand up. So Mrs Khan shook her head and said she was going to make sure that whoever it was be caught soon and punished, not just by her, but by Mrs Sanders too. And then, after that, came the worst trick of all, the one that everyone in the school later called the Great Baked Beans Bag Trap. Every morning, right before Mrs Khan takes the register, everyone has to put their school bag on their own special hook at the back of the class and we were only allowed to take our PE kit or homework or lunch boxes out when we're told to. Everyone knows whose bag is where because everyone's hook has their name on top. Just days after the day of the deathly worm tray, Mrs Khan told us to get up and collect our PE kits from our bags, just like she always did on Wednesdays. But when Armit went to get his PE kit and unzipped his rucksack, a lumpy river of baked beans burst out and splodged and splashed all over him. Everyone cried out, Ew! and then instantly fell silent. Mrs Khan was so angry when no one put their hand up again that she cancelled PE and Mrs Sanders came and told the whole class off. It was horrible, 
especially because Ahmet started to cry when he saw what had happened to his PE kit and his bag. I think everyone knew it was Brendan the bully who had done all these things, but no one could prove it, not even Mrs Khan. After that day, the door to the classroom was locked every break time and at lunchtime, which stopped anything else from happening at Ar to Ahmet's things. But I wanted more than anything for Brendan the bully to be caught and to prove he was a criminal, so Michael brought his granddad's magnifying glass in and we all searched for clues. But we couldn't find a single one, not even in the school bins. Ahmet was more upset about the great baked beans bag trap than baked beans bag trap than all of the other things that had happened. And even though Mrs. Hempsey washed his rucksack with lots of washing up liquid, it looked even worse than before and smelled strange too. But Ahmet still brought it into school every day. I wanted to know why he didn't get a new one or why Mrs. Hempsey kept saying that it looked fine when it didn't. And then, just two days after the great baked beans bag trap, I found out. We had all put away our books and were getting ready for group story time, just like we always did on Fridays, when Mrs Khan made a surprise announcement. Now everyone, she said, this is our last afternoon before we all break up for the half-term holidays, and I thought we could do with a treat. Instead of us all reading a story together, we're going to listen to one instead, and it's a very important story, because it's going to be told to us by someone very special in our class. Looking over at Armit and Mrs Hemsey, she waved them over to where she was standing, I didn't know it was it just then, but I was about to hear all of my original 11 questions answered in one go. We all turned around to watch as Mrs Hemsey picked up a large pile of papers from the table and followed Armit to the front of the class. I want everyone to listen extra carefully and I don't want anyone asking any questions until after Armit has finished telling his stories. Is that understood? Yes, Mrs Khan, shouted the class. Good. And leaning against her desk, Mrs Khan smiled and said, Armit. Everyone shuffled in their chairs and sat up straight, waiting for Armit to speak. I wondered if he would tell, tell the story in English or in Kurdish, but I was so excited I didn't really care. Hello, my name is Armit. I am nine years old and I am refugee. I come from Syria. And he said that, as he said this, he pointed to Mrs Hemsey who held up a drawing showing a house and a tree and a car in front of some mountains. And in front of the car were four people, labelled me, mum, dad and sister, and a cat. This was the drawing. I was surprised because I had never thought about Armit having a brother or a sister. I thought he was like me and didn't have any. His sister wasn't at our school. In the picture, she looked smaller than him, so maybe she was in nursery. But in Syria, there is big war, said Armit, and he pointed to Mrs Hemsey again, who held up another picture. This one showed buildings on fire and bombs dropping from planes and lots of people lying on the ground and other people holding guns. It looked like this. Josie stopped chewing her hair and looked at me and then looked at the drawing again. And from behind, I heard someone whisper, Whoa, he's seen a real bomb and a real gun. Because of war, my family run away, said Armit, as his lion eyes became big and round and watery. We went on mountain and rivers and carry bags and cat. This time, Mrs Hemsey held up a picture showing a family crossing mountains and rivers and in the sky, birds that were crying. In the picture, Armit had drawn himself carrying a red rucksack with a black stripe on it, just like the one he had now. That was when I knew why he loved it so much and why he cried when it had been filled with Brendan the Bully's horrible baked beans. He had carried it all the way from his house and over a mountain, which meant it had lots more important and lots more special, which meant it was lots more important and lots more special than any of our bags. This was the picture. Then, nowhere safe, so we got on boat and on big sea. This time, Mrs Hemsey held up a drawing of a boat, but the boat wasn't like a normal boat with sails and pointy ends and wooden sides. This one was flat and round with orange on the sides, just like the ones I had seen on the news that didn't have any toilets on them. And inside the boat were lots of people wearing vests that made them look like puffin birds, but there were people in the water too, and they had bubbles coming out of their net mouths saying, help me. Everyone leans, leaned forward in their chairs and tried to read the labels Armit had put over some of the people's heads. 
I saw me and mum and dad, but there wasn't one for sister or cat. I know cats don't like water because Josie has a cat and she says it screams whenever it rains and always wants to stay inside. So maybe Ahmet's cat didn't want to get into the boat and maybe his sister didn't want to leave it behind. So she stayed behind to look after it. This was the boat picture. Then we were, are in another country called Greece, said Ahmet. We live in tent with lots of people who run away like me. They come from lots of country like Afghanistan and Pakistan. The next picture showed a flag with blue and white stripes and a white cross in a blue corner. And next to it, there were lots of tents and people everywhere sitting next to fires and sleeping on the floor. In this picture, only the words me and dad could be seen. Ahmet's mum must be sleeping inside one of the tents. This was the picture. Then we walk long time in lots of country. It was cold and we sleep on floor. And then we stay in France. This time, Ahmet pointed to the next picture with his finger and showed us the railway tracks he had drawn. On it were people carrying suitcases and children and all of them were walking to a wall with barbed wire on the top. Everyone looked sad. And in the corner, there were army tanks and soldiers holding guns and all the guns were pointing at the people with the suitcase and the children. Mrs Hemsey held this drawing up for longer than any of the others because Ahmet was looking at it and didn't seem to want to stop staring at it. This was the drawing. Then I come here and come to school. I like here, no bombs, it's safe, and I like new friends and teacher and play football. Ahmet stood and stared at everyone, and everyone stared back. Mrs Clark Khan blew her nose loudly, and Mrs Hemsey put the drawing down and gave Ahmet a hug. Thank you, Ahmet, said Mrs Khan, standing up and putting a hand on his shoulder. Everyone, let's give Ahmet a huge round of applause for being so brave and for sharing his story with us. We all clapped, but we didn't clap as loud as we usually do for stories, because I think we were feeling strange. I don't think any of us had ever heard a story like it before, and as sad and as scary as it was, it, me it was even sadder and scarier because it wasn't just a made-up story from one of our reading books, it was all real. Ahmet had survived everything his picture had shown us and was here, with us. Knowing that made me feel sorry and proud and scared for him all at once. But most of all, it made me want to tell him he was definitely the bravest person I knew. Now, as you have seen, Ahmet's story is very special and I'm sure you have lots of questions you want to ask him, said Mrs Khan. Everyone's hands immediately shot up into the air, but I think mine was first. That's wonderful, smiled Mrs Khan as she signalled to us to put our hands back down. But as Ahmet is still learning his English words, we're only going to ask him three questions. I want you all to write down just one question for him on a piece of paper. Mrs Khan walked around and gave us each a thin slip of blank paper. And when you're done, Mrs Hemsey is going to pick out three questions we can ask him. You have a few minutes to think of your questions and to write it out in your very neatest handwriting. Try to get all your spellings right and remember, just one question each. The entire class fell silent as everyone grabbed their pencils, put their heads down and wrote out their questions. I had lots of questions that I wanted to ask, but I picked the one was th that was most new and wrote th that one out. After a few minutes, Mrs Khan said our time was up and Mrs Hemsey collected all the pe bits of paper. Everyone began to whisper to one another as Mrs Khan and Mrs Hemsey looked through our questions and either shook their heads or nodded. What did you ask? whispered Tom, turning around. I asked why he didn't stay in Greece, because the weather's warmer there and they have more seaside places, whispered back Josie. Oh, I asked how fast he had to run to get away from the bombs, whispered Tom. Michael, what did you ask, whispered Josie, leaning forward and poking Michael on the shoulder. I asked if it was scary to be in the boat and if he was on it at night time, said Michael. That's two questions, whispered Josie, shaking her head. Then she looked at me. What did you ask? I asked what happened to his cat and what his sister's name was, I answered. Oh, said Tom, but that's two questions as well. Right, everyone, said Mrs Khan, clapping her hands so that we all stopped whispering and looked to the front of the class. We have some excellent questions here, but we've chosen three. I'm going to say them in English and then Mrs Hemsey is going to translate both the question and the answer for us. Right, the first question is, what did your mum and dad do in Syria? Mrs Hemsey spoke to Ahmet in Kurdish and he said something back. Mrs Hemsey nodded and then looking at us, she said... Ahmet's father was a teacher and his mother wrote for a newspaper. 
Everyone in the class nodded and we waited for Mrs Khan to read out the next question. I crossed my fingers extra tight in the hope that it would be mine. The next question is, what did you like doing most before the war happened? We waited for Mrs Hemsey to tell Armit what the question was and then reply. He liked to play football with his friends, answered Mrs Hemsey, and going to the park with his grandfather. She smiled at Armit and before anybody could ask what a kibi was, it, um, was explained a kibi is a very special snack which is filled with mincemeat in the middle and is covered with lots of delicious spices. It's very famous in Syria and it looks like... Mrs Hemsey went over to the blackboard and quickly drew a shape. It looked like a small American football. Is that the right shape, Armit? she asked and nodded. We all looked at each other and tried to imagine what an American football with minced meat in the middle might taste like. As Mrs Khan held up the last slip of paper, I decided to cross both my fingers and toes. But it didn't work, because then she said, and the last question is, do you still sleep in a tent or do you sleep in a house now? When Armit heard this question from Mrs Hemsey, he shook his head and said something. No, he sleeps in a house now, said Mrs Hemsey, and he is happy because there is a toilet in it and hot water and food. As we all nodded to each other, Mrs Khan put her arm around Armit and said, let's give Armit another round of applause, shall we? This time, nearly everyone clapped much louder than before, and Michael even cried out, woohoo! As Armit and Mrs Hemsey went and sat back down, but I could see Brendan the bully mouthing, boo, and making a face as if something smelled, and Liam gave, giving a double thumbs down. I looked back at Mrs Khan and Mrs Hemsey, hoping that they had seen too, but they were busy looking at Armit. Right, now everyone, before we leave today, I want you all to listen to me very carefully. Mrs Khan clapped her hands once and waited for everyone to settle back down. As I said, you all had some fantastic questions for Armit, and I am proud of you for thinking up such interesting and wonderful thought, thoughtful ones too. But, and here she looked at us with her eyebrows raised, which meant she was being extra serious and would get angry if we didn't listen to her. I'm sure I don't have to tell you that running away from a war and leaving your home is a very hard thing to do. And it's especially hard when you have to try and put all the missing pieces of your life back together again in a place that's new and strange to you. Then Mrs Khan quickly glanced at me and Josie and Michael and Tom and said, I know that some of you miss Armit when he's not allowed to go out and play. And I know you all have lots of questions for him. But it's very important that he talks to people who know what he's been through and who can help him feel better. It's even more important that they can ask him the kinds of questions you all want to ask him in a safe and secluded space first before he's ready to speak to other people more, okay? Josie looked over at me and I looked over at her and Tom and Michael looked over their shoulders at us. So that was what the seclusion was for. It was so that Armit could talk to people. So, continued Mrs Khan, I want you all to promise me that you won't ask Armit any more questions about the war or about his family without asking me or Mrs Hemsey first. Is that understood? Yes, Mrs Khan, said the class, as the bell for home time began to ring. Good. Now, put away your things and off you go. Make sure you all have everything you need for your homework assignments for the half term. And I'll see you in a week's time. As we waited for our road to be called out, I looked over my shoulder as Armit, at Armit and wondered what pieces he was still missing before he could put his life back together again. It was like a jigsaw, I thought. I hate doing jigsaws even the easy ones, because I always get bored halfway through and I couldn't imagine trying to do that to do that one that had missing pieces. I sure hoped that when he was running away from all the bullies and the bombs, Armit hadn't lost any of the important pieces on the way and that, if he had, someone was helping him find new ones that were exactly in the right shape and colours that he needed. So, see you soon for chapter 11.